guess? Fifteen gallons. Not, not that close. Anybody else have another guess? No. Uh, okay. The answer is actually about a thousand gallons of water a day. That's embedded in the food that we eat, right? Now, water is really heavy. Uh, it weighs about eight and a third pounds uh, per gallon. Um, so that comes out to about four tons of water each day that you are personally uh, responsible for consuming. But that's not all the water we use each day because we all have, from jackets to shoes, we're wearing garments that require about 6,000 gallons, uh, 24 tons to make. Um, it rarely occurs to the general public and only very recently, I must say, to our corporate CEOs that industry would grind to a halt without, without access to vast quantities of clean, fresh water. Just producing that small integrated circuit that powers your computer requires 2,000 gallons of ultra-pure water, eight and a half tons. A typical semiconductor plant uses as much water as a city of 50,000 people. But, you know, of course, the, the largest and fast, fastest growing uh, water user in the United States and in the industrial countries is not for growing food or producing things, but for producing energy. Almost half of U.S. water is withdrawn for energy. Now, ever since the invention of the water wheel 2,000 years ago uh, and the modern steam engine uh, in the 18th century, uh, the giant hydropower dams of the 20th century, energy and water have been joined in what I would call a deepening matrimony of interdependence. We need lots and lots of water to produce all sorts of energy, but we also need lots of energy to move and treat all that very heavy water around. Water and energy, in fact, have evolved such a total interdependence that our currently our separate treat, treatment of them, and from a policy standpoint, has really become outdated. We really must now think of them as inseparable components of a complementary nexus with resource planning and engineering with this fact in mind. And I've got to tell you, um, right now we are headed for an alarming collision between the world's thirst for energy and the available energy supply, a uh, water supply, I'm sorry. Even in the United States, we cannot achieve the projected 40% increase in energy due to water shortages. We're facing a water uh, energy short uh, choke point. Of course, we have often been a force to, to abandon many conventional, and I know here in, in, in Utah you're, you're thinking about a nuclear uh, power plant projects due to insufficient water resources for cooling them. But most people, including our policymakers, don't realize that most of the alternative and non-conventional energies that we're counting on for the future uh, requires several orders of magnitude more water uh, than conventional energies. And some are located in regions that are already very water stressed. Promising technologies like shale oil, uh, which is in the eastern Rockies and the northern high plains, the thermal solar in the southwest, uh, the first generation energy crops like corn ethanol, which frankly are insanely, thanks to misguided subsidies, being uh, irrigated and <laughs> uh, with, with, with depleting fossil aquifer water in the Midwest, at a rate a thousand times more water intensive than conventional gasoline. Look, the, the, these projects cannot be built to out to anywhere near the projected needs due to water scarcity. So the first lesson really to, to keep in mind is that, that there really is not, there is going to be an increasingly fierce competition among water for all of its different needs, the traditional needs, and not all of them can be satisfied unless we can come up with a way of inventing and implementing a much more efficient new paradigm in how we manage our existing water resources today. Now, although global uh, water scarcity is a, is a new phenomenon, water's primary importance in world history is not. In fact, I subtitled the book uh, Water, the Epic Struggle for Wealth, Power, and Civilization because in every age of history, control and marshalling of water resources has been a central axis of power and of wealth creation. And epic water breakthroughs have often been associated with the rise and decline of great states and key turning points in human civilization. Just think, the agricultural revolution that launched the four original cradle civilizations of Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, and in Yellow, Yellow River in China were based on mass scale irrigation. Fast forward 5,000 years to the Industrial Revolution. What was its seminal invention? The steam engine, yes. Uh, water in another form, innovated by James Watt. <clears throat> the health and the renowned military strength of the Roman Empire 
and its imperial capital of one million people was, was sustained by 11, 11 gravity-flowing uh, aqueducts that covered 300 miles and brought clean, wholesome water in amounts comparable to what we enjoy today, by the way, uh, to homes, fountains, and baths, and then flushed the whole thing out uh, down through, to, to, uh, through, through a sanitary system into the Tiber River. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, you might not think that a million people may not sound like many by today's standards, but for most of human history, cities have been unsanitary human death traps, populations replenished only by influx from the countryside. In 1800, there were only six cities could sustain over half a million people on the earth. The demographic transition underpinning our modern urban uh, industrial civilization, and half of us today live in cities and 70% will in the future, was made possible by a mid-19th century sanitary revolution that started in London in reaction to very, uh, the deadly epidemics of cholera and other waterborne diseases that afflicted and threatened to impede the development of early industrial society. Eventually, it contributed uh, to a public health revolution and the amazing, um, really stunning, decrease in child mortality and increase in human longevity. Uh, water of, was also instrumental in the making of the United States, as it was in many uh, of other great countries, by harnessing and marrying the resources of our three distinctive hydrological zones, uh, the moist-rich, river-rich, temperate east, our seascapes, and the arid lands of the west. The seminal breakthrough in the east, which had, uh, was, was the use of water power to power factories, and then a navigation system, which was then... Um, <clears throat> that joined them together and uh, linked it to the vast Mississippi by the completion of the Erie Canal, 360 miles long. <clears throat> Teddy Roosevelt's... <clears throat> excuse me again, I'm sorry. Mm. Can't do without it. Can't do without it. Many, many purposes. T Teddy Roosevelt's built that epic Panama Canal that united our two oceans uh, and, and married the resources of the west to the east. And finally, in the 20th century, the monumental multipurpose dams pioneered at Hoover that brought irrigation, hydroelectricity, and flood controls to transform the so-called arid lands of our far west into one of the most productive regions on the planet. There are some 45,000 of these giant dams have been built around the world since then, nearly half of them, by the way, including the world's largest in China. And they became linchpins of the Green Revolution, that helped feed the more than quadrupling of world population in the last century to over six and a half billion people and did so without mass starvation, which is an anomaly in world history. Which, of course, brings us full circle back to a major cause of today's global freshwater scarcity crisis, population pressures. The way I see it, today's global uh, crisis presents two interrelated epochal challenges to mankind. One is environmental and one closely related is political. First, environmentally. We are, by drawing so much water, by drawing more water from the environment than replenishes through the water cycle and through the pollution of existing resources, mankind is degrading our freshwater ecosystems to an unprecedented and perilous extent. There is so much water withdrawn from 70 major rivers, including the Nile, the Indus, the Yellow, the Euphrates, the Colorado, of course, that their flows trickle to their deltas that have shriveled up. Half the world's wetlands have vanished to development. We have, of course, agrochemical and industrial pollution that is devastating fish life, contaminating our drinking supplies, and entering the human food chain. Mountain glaciers from the Himalayas to the Andes are melting at rates never before seen and are drying up the source of mighty rivers and threatening the stability of the nations downstream that depend upon its waters. Now, due to groundwater mining, Water tables are plunging in the food belts of northern China, India, Pakistan, including California's Central Valley and the southern High Plains Aquifer here in the Midwest. As a result, for the very first time since the dawn of civilization, it is imperative that we consciously allocate water for a fifth primary new use of water, and that is for environmental flows to sustain the health of the ecosystems that are the wellsprings for all of society's vital economic and human uses of water. Now, the environmental crisis brings us to a political, uh, associated political challenge. Due to the divergent global population pressures and the uneven natural distribution of water around the planet, 
Global society is polarizing right before our very eyes into water have and have nots, posing many national security threats both to this country and transforming uh, world geopolitics. Some of the headlines are these. On, on freshwater scarcity is a key reason why there are going to be three and a half billion people per, living in countries that will not be able to feed themselves by 2025. And this is going to include giants like, that have been exporters like uh, India, Pakistan, and very possibly China. Now, how much food these countries need to import will squeeze the food availability and increase prices and volatility from Africa to Southeast Asia, including that politically combustible demographic, uh, demographic volcano of the Middle East, which ran out of water, by the way, to feed itself in the 1970s, and in coming years is going to have to import 70% of its food. Uh, worldwide, it's projected that food production is going to have to be increased by 40% just to keep up with the soaring population demands. Food insecurity is already triggering a worldwide arable land rush, a land grab, if you will, where countries from the Persian Gulf to China and South, even South Korea are racing against each other to lock in long-term leases in countries with remaining arable land and adequate water supplies. Just take Saudi Arabia, which... Uh, back in the 1970s, feared uh, that we would impose a food embargo in response to their, um, their oil embargo, they began to, pump, to profligately pump out the water in an aquifer that lies underneath the desert to be able to become self-sufficient in food. In fact, they even became the sixth largest exporter of wheat in the world. But half its aquifer is now gone, and they realize this, and they have now switched their, their strategy to trying to lease farmland wherever they can places like Pakistan's Punjab, uh, the Nile Basin in Ethiopia and Sudan, and even parts of the United States. This is a rather dubious strategy, uh, at least as far as uh, the Nile and the, uh, and the Indus Valley are concerned, however, because those regions don't have enough uh, water to be able to sustain the populations in, uh, in, in those areas. Um, so food crisis and water crisis are, are really uh, very closely linked. We also have a humanitarian health crisis are very likely to emanate from the 2.6 billion people who today lack adequate sanitation and 1 billion who lack access to safe drinking water. Now, it's really a, a heartbreaking inequity of human development that I've seen with my own eyes in, in, in places like Kenya to see women and children spend hours each day foraging for the equivalent of three to four of our low flush toilet, uh, toilet flushes, sorry, low f three to four of our low-flow toilet flushes for all of their water needs, for everything, all household needs. Um, water have-not nations are facing deeping, deepening energy crises that impinge their ability to produce the energy they need for economic development. Take Iraq today. Uh, industries and, and agriculture are laboring under crippling shortages of electric power and irrigation due to diminished flows in the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. The ultimate fate of post-Saddam society and all the U.S. war effort that, uh, that went into it for so many years hinges very significantly on how much water is going to be siphoned off upstream by the Middle East's new water superpower, which is Turkey, where the twin, the twin rivers originate, and also by Syria, which is also upstream of Iraq. In aggregate, those three nations, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, are building water projects that are predicated upon drawing one and a half times the entire flow of the Euphrates River. That's physically impossible. And the decision about how much is going to be allocated is going to be the upstream state, which is Turkey, is going to have the largest say in that. Uh, take China. It, it is, it has, it's undergoing a relentless drive for more clean and renewable hydroelectricity to power its, to its economic growth. And to do so, it's damming the great rivers of Asia that rise in the Tibetan Plateau, the so-called water towers of Asia, because, um, and because they downstream, there are about 2 billion people that depend upon the waters that originate there. Ten years from now, you're going to be hearing headlines about China's use of the waters of the Tibetan Plateau, both as a source of hegemonic power, but also the stuff of potential flashpoints for conflict on the Mekong and perhaps on the Brahmaputra with India. Now, few people realize, however, that freshwater scarcity is one of China's major potential economic choke points that could stymie its breakneck growth and bid for superpower status. The country has only one-fifth the amount of fresh water per person than we do here in the United States. 
and such severe shortages in its parched north that make the, our arid west look like a